All stations on Dragon, one minute until configure for terminal count. You have 30 seconds. Minus 15 seconds. Top 9, go for propellant loading. Dragon is in countdown. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. You are looking at a live view of SpaceX's first Crew Dragon spacecraft atop a Falcon 9 rocket awaiting liftoff in just under an hour from now as part of the first crew demonstration mission to the International Space Station for NASA. Good evening and good morning and welcome to the live broadcast of NASA and SpaceX's first crew demo mission to the space station. My name's Dan Hewitt, I'm a public affairs officer with NASA and I'm really excited to be here at SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California for today's launch. Dan, it is so awesome to have you here. It's awesome to be here. Thank you for coming. My name is Lauren Lyons, and I'm a senior flight reliability engineer here at SpaceX. And as you can see, NASA and SpaceX have partnered on both the Demo-1 mission and today's broadcast. We'll be bringing you live coverage from not only here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, but also NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, as well as the Johnson Space Center in Houston. As many of you probably already know, the purpose of today's mission is to demonstrate the ability of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket and the Crew Dragon vehicle to carry people safely to and from the International Space Station. Today's mission is a test flight. While there are no actual humans on board, we're going to be executing every step of this mission as if there were. It's worth noting that for purposes of this broadcast, we will be using the terms Crew Dragon and Dragon interchangeably to refer to this next iteration of our spacecraft. The Dragon we fly for our CRS missions has already made 16 visits to the International Space Station, but this is the first time that Crew Dragon is making that journey. From start to finish, this mission will last approximately six days, and it's going to start with liftoff just under an hour from now. Once Falcon 9 has lifted Dragon into orbit, the spacecraft will make its way to the space station over a period of approximately 27 hours. This time period is a little bit longer than what we anticipate once people are actually on board, but for this mission, it allows ample time to conduct all the necessary testing and demos prior to SpaceX's first docking of Crew Dragon with the space station. Once Dragon arrives at station, it's expected to stay for about five days, during which time it'll undergo a series of checkouts of many of the new systems, as well as the ISS interfaces. While it's docked, it'll deliver some cargo to space station that we've launched, but it will also bring some cargo back that the crew will pack up in Dragon on the way back home. At the end of that five-day dock period, Dragon will depart the ISS for a splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean, where it'll be met by recovery crews and transported back to our site at Cape Canaveral. And for everybody watching and following along at home, if you have a question about this mission or any of the upcoming crewed missions, we'd love to answer them later in this broadcast. You can send them in using the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. This is such an awesome and exciting day for the teams both at NASA and SpaceX. And with just under an hour to lift off, let's check in with the team over in Florida broadcasting live from Kennedy Space Center. Thank you, Lauren and Dan. Now, my name is Shiva Bharadvaj, and I'm a Falcon Integration and Test Engineer at SpaceX. And I'm Stephanie Martin with NASA's Commercial Crew Program. We are broadcasting live from the press site here at Kennedy. Yeah, we're actually just across the street from the iconic Vehicle Assembly Building and just over three miles away from our launch site. Now, there are hundreds of members of the media at Cape Kennedy to capture today's historic launch from the equally historic Launch Complex 39A, or LC-39A, which has been a central part of the American human spaceflight story. This is the home to both the Apollo and Space Shuttle programs. Just behind us, you can see the Falcon 9 and Dragon prepared to launch from this historic launch pad. SpaceX took over Launch Complex 39A in 2014, and after retrofitting it, they have been able to support both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches regularly since 2017. Yeah, actually, there's a great shot on your screen of our two-stage launch vehicle, the Falcon 9. Uh, and actually, the crew arm is attached to it. Oh, actually, there, the crew arm is separating away from the vehicle. And this test is, we're uh, running this test the same way that we would with astronauts on board. So that would be one of the steps as we prepare to go into today's launch. Now, Falcon 9 is a, uh, Falcon 9 
first stage will fire its nine Merlin engines to propel the vehicle to the edge of space. Once it's burned through most of its propellant, it will separate and attempt to land on our drone ship, which is about 316 miles off the Florida coast. Simultaneously, the second stage will fire its single high-efficiency Merlin vacuum engine to propel Dragon to its target orbit about 200 kilometers above the Earth. From there, Dragon will continue with its first journey to the International Space Station. Now, True Crew Dragon consists of two main structures, the capsule where we fly pressurized cargo and soon our astronauts who cannot be exposed to the vacuum of space. And the second main structure is the trunk where we can carry a large unpressurized cargo. A notable difference on the Crew Dragon vehicle is that it's eight Super Draco thrusters. These Super Dracos will power the astronauts to safety in the unlikely event of an emergency. Crew Dragon's trunk also features new body-mounted solar arrays, which you can see on your screen right now. They provide power to the spacecraft as it makes its way to the International Space Station. The trunk also has new aerodynamic fins, which provide stability in the event of that emergency abort, as well as more surface area for those solar arrays. Now that was a quick overview of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon here at Kennedy Space Center. However, let's go quickly over to Daryl Nail, who has a special guest at the Operations and Support Building. That's right, Stephanie. I'm on the fifth floor of that building, which gives us an elevated view of the launch pad. And you can see, we can see the rocket from top to bottom, including the flame trench. It is a beautiful view out here. And then we stretch out a little further, and you can see the guests that have gathered in the infield. They have quite a view as well. This building is also right next to the iconic vehicle assembly building, which is the perfect backdrop for our guest, as you mentioned, Administrator Jim Bridenstein. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Daryl. Great to be here. First of all, tell me what this launch means to you. What does it mean to the country? So this is the first time where we're going to launch uh, American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, uh, the first time since the retirement of the space shuttles in 2011. So this is really a, 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 a significant achievement in the history of, of American spaceflight. And uh, what we're interested in, we want to make sure that uh, we keep our partnership with Russia, which has been very strong for a long period of time, going all the way back to the Apollo-Soyuz era. But we also want to make sure we have our own capability to get back and forth to the International Space Station so that we can have this strong partnership where they can launch on our rockets and we can launch on their rockets. Uh, but I think another big milestone here is the idea that we're not, as an agency, as NASA, we're not purchasing, owning, and operating our own rockets at this point. We're looking to a future where we can be a customer, one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. And not just one customer of many customers, which dries down our costs and increases our access, but having multiple providers that are competing on cost and innovation which enables us to have transformational technologies that enable us to do more than ever before. So and this is really a, a big deal. And one of those customers, key customers, SpaceX, which is launching tonight, you're here for that launch. You got to tour around today with SpaceX CEO Elon Musk. How yeah. was that? It was, it was a, a, a great opportunity. Uh, he, he reminded me that he began this process 18 years ago, if you can imagine that, back in 2001. And at the time, you know, the, the intent uh, was to put a, a little greenhouse on Mars, and he was going to, um, you know, purchase a, an excess ICBM from Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, he made sure to make clear that it was without the nuclear warhead. <laughs> um, but, but what was fascinating is from that idea where he wanted to put on Mars a little greenhouse, we're talking about three feet by three feet, just a small greenhouse. Um, and from that, he tried to buy this, this excess ICBM, but it was $20 million. And he said, okay, I just can't afford that to achieve what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, and, and so he, he came up with the idea of, of, Falcon, of a Falcon 1. Uh, and after a number of failed launches, he stuck with it. And by Falcon 4, it was successful. And, uh, and, and then, of course, the partnership with NASA and a, you know, a long partnership that's been developing for a long time. And here we are on the precipice of returning to space flight from American soil. Uh, so it was great to have that opportunity to hear his perspectives. And um, this is really a, a, you know, a big day for NASA. It's a big day for SpaceX, Elon Musk, and the entire team, uh, both teams, NASA and SpaceX. And we're looking forward to a launch tonight. We appreciate you coming out and joining us. It's going to be an exciting night. We want to toss it back now to Tom, who is at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Tom. 
Thanks, Daryl. Uh, good evening, my name is Tom Perderio and I'm a software engineer here at SpaceX. And hanging right behind me at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California is the very first uh, Dragon spacecraft that SpaceX launched to orbit back in 2010. And now here we are, almost, or just less than 40 minutes from launching our first Crew Dragon spacecraft to the space station. It's currently T minus 38 minutes and 40 seconds, and the SpaceX team is working no issues for launch. Here's where we stand on the rocket, the spacecraft, and the launch. For the Falcon 9, the critical go, no-go poll was held at about T minus 45 minutes when the SpaceX launch director polled the teams to assess their readiness for launch. All teams are currently go for launch, and we are ready to begin propellant loading on the rocket at about T minus 35 minutes. In fact, you may hear final instructions for the team in the background on the launch nets. For the Dragon spacecraft, earlier today, Dragon operators performed a series of checkouts across all of Dragon's flight systems, and the capsules also currently go for launch. If this were an operational mission, late load cargo would have already been loaded onto Dragon the day of launch, which would have been earlier today, and the crew would already have boarded via the crew access arm. Once everyone is safely on board, SpaceX would retract, or you saw SpaceX just retract the crew access arm, which activates the launch escape system, and this allows the initiation of a pad escape in the event of an emergency. Uh, the range currently is supporting uh, us for a launch today, no issues with that. Uh, with weather, there are three main categories of weather uh, things that SpaceX and the range looks for. One of those is upper level winds, the other is ground level winds, and the other is the uh, anvil cloud and lightning rules. Uh, right now, there's no uh, weather constraints for launch today. Uh, so as the team has mentioned, there are no people on board Dragon today, but we do actually have one special passenger flying, and her name is Ripley. You can actually see her sitting there in the live views we have from Dragon uh, getting ready for launch. Ripley will be gathering some very important data for us in advance of our first crew missions. And she's also taking up a zero gravity indicator in the shape of the Earth, which you can see the uh, blue Earth figure right next to her uh, in the seat closest to the camera. Once we are clear of the Earth's gravity, that zero G indicator, indicator will be free to move about the cabin. Let's uh, take a closer look at Ripley's role and the on her trip to the International Space Station. As a part of our Demonstration 1 mission, we have a special passenger on board. The technical term for a special passenger is an anthropomorphic test device, or in short, an ATD. But we're just going to call her Ripley. My name is Ali Reza Farjud, and I'm a senior dynamics engineer here at SpaceX. Ripley's job is to feel everything that an astronaut will feel when they fly on Dragon. She is essentially full of sensors across her body, including the head, neck, and spine. For this mission, Ripley is going to use 10 out of her 30 sensors to give us all the information we need about the most sensitive parts of her body. She is going to give us information about her body loads and the seat loads, and we're going to use all that information to analyze and make sure our predictions are correct to design tests and understand exact behavior of the seat system in Crew Dragon. From liftoff to splashdown, essentially she is going to tell us how she feels during the whole mission. We also have a microphone around her ears so we're going to hear whatever she hears. The goal of this mission is to make sure that the crew are going to be safe, comfortable, and enjoy the ride on the Dragon. During a nominal ascent, the crew will feel like they're riding on an exciting roller coaster ride. On the way back, during a nominal splashdown, the crew will feel like they are diving into a swimming pool. Interestingly, this is not the first time we're using this technology to make sure that the crew are going to be safe. The first time was in 2015 on the paddleboard test. In addition to these tests, we're doing a lot more testing to make sure all the worst case scenarios are understood, the crew are going to be safe, and all our injury metrics are within limits. We're going to be using this technology again in the future. In fact, Ripley is going to be flying in our in-flight aboard test later this year. We're not going to be getting real-time data for this mission. Once Ripley comes back home, she is going to give us all the data, and that's going to get us one step closer to human spaceflight for everyone. We are at three T minus 34 minutes and 38 seconds. The call for propellant load is coming up in just a few moments here, so let's listen in for that call out on the nets.
For those of you just joining us, we are just waiting for the callout uh, for beginning propellant load on the Falcon 9 rocket. We have not heard that callout yet, but it is coming up in just a few minutes. Stand by. So while we're waiting for the call out for that prop load, uh, we're going to go over to McManus Woodend at Banana Creek to get a sense of how the feeling is at the Cape. How's it going over there, McManus? Everything is looking great out here, Tom, and uh, we wish Ripley all the best of luck on her incredible, incredible journey. I'm McManus Woodend and I'm here at Kennedy Space Center. Particularly, I am here at the Banana Creek uh, viewing area, uh, which is right across the way from the Saturn V uh, center. Now, one of the great things about this viewing area here at Banana Creek is you have an unfiltered panoramic view of five launch pads. Now, the pad that we'll be looking at tonight will be pad 39A, which you've already heard so far in the program has quite a historical significance. 12 Apollo launches and 82 shuttle launches took place at pad 39A, and we're hoping that SpaceX is able to continue that history tonight. Now, if you look at the crowd, we're, they're starting to still filter in, uh, but we're looking at roughly 1,700 in attendance tonight. Uh, the vast majority of them are uh, from here in America, so the sentiment of an American-built rocket uh, being launched from American soil uh, and, and with the anticipation of American astronauts later this year being flown on that rocket uh, is pretty high. But that's not to say that it's a complete home team uh, type of a game. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few uh, representatives from other foreign countries that bring a unique perspective uh, to this launch because they look at it from a global perspective. Uh, so just imagine, if you will, somebody in this audience tonight has the ability at some point in time in their lives to board a rocket, fly to space, and then look down at the Earth uh, instead of through the lens of a NASA photo, which we've all become so accustomed to, uh, but with their very own eyes. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, those two uh, are the main talking points that I've, I've had with uh, many of the folks here in the audience. Uh, so uh, as you can imagine, the anticipation and the energy is quite strong. Uh, but as you can see, everyone is starting to settle into their seats and they're getting ready to enjoy this amazing launch. Uh, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and send it back to Shiva and Stephanie right down the road at our studio. Guys? Thanks, McManus. That's, uh, that's an awesome crowd out there. Now, we do want to let you guys know that uh, propellant loading has begun on the Falcon 9. Now, also, as a reminder, today's launch is a test flight, and while SpaceX has been transporting cargo to and from the International Space Station since 2012, this flight is the first time that we'll be launching a Crew Dragon with the upgrades to Falcon 9 and Dragon that will allow us to fly astronauts. Now, we haven't launched astronauts from the U.S. soil to the International Space Station since the Space Shuttle Atlantis landed in 2011. Today's launch is a major test to help us restore that capability to America with the idea that one day space travel won't just be for NASA astronauts. Stage two, present for flight. Ground gas closeouts are complete. Go for launch. The purpose of the commercial crew program is to return to our nation the capability to fly our astronauts to the International Space Station. Five, four, three. This commercial crew program is the beginning, I think, of an entirely two, new era. One, lift off. Astronauts taking flight once more from American soil as the nation begins a new chapter of space exploration. Up until now, it's been governments that have sent people into space. And you know, working with our NASA partners, we are on the doorstep of being able to open it up to a much greater population. It's not often that you get to be part of developing a spacecraft from scratch. That opportunity comes along after many decades. Both of our companies, Boeing and SpaceX, are incredibly capable companies. It's just an awesome feeling to see the hardware coming together and seeing you know, the excitement of the of the technicians, of the engineers. It's going to be wonderful to see the crowds come back. This is great to get the public uh, kind of re-engaged on human spaceflight again. Transportation to low Earth orbit is super important to humans because right now that's where we are operating and doing a lot of our work in space. The International Space Station, one of the nation's great assets for research and discovery, is in low Earth orbit. 
and the Commercial Crew Program will be providing transportation to ISS to support that first step as a gateway to space. I think we're going to have a lot more opportunity to do the exploration research that we need to get us to the moon and to Mars and beyond. There's a larger group of us that are dreaming that potentially could have a ride someday and be working in space. It's a huge goal, a huge accomplishment for both the partners, NASA, and the United States of America. This is just the beginning. I know the greatest events in space exploration have not happened yet, and that our destiny lies above us. Unlike traditional NASA programs, where we gave very prescriptive requirements, for commercial crew, NASA set high-level requirements based on our 50 years of human spaceflight experience for Boeing and SpaceX to meet. Our partners took those high-level requirements and introduced new technologies, procedures, and the out-of-the-box thinking that we have come to expect for the American aerospace industry. Now, SpaceX is one of the companies that NASA ultimately chose to achieve this goal, and we've been able to introduce innovative ideas in collaboration with NASA, and together we've designed Crew Dragon to be one of the safest human spaceflight systems ever flown. Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. The Crew Dragon builds on our Cargo Dragon 17 successful flights to and from orbit since 2010, including 16 trips to the International Space Station. Not only have we conducted thousands of hours of testing, we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features. As an example, Dragon now has enhanced and additional parachutes. We used to have three, and we added a fourth one for redundancy. And one of the most important safety features on Crew Dragon is our launch escape system, which is a huge advancement in the safety of human spaceflight. In 2015, we demonstrated the system during our pad abort test. Now, the launch escape system is outfitted with eight Super Draco engines that are directly integrated into the spacecraft body. This enables Crew Dragon to maintain escape capability from the launch pad all the way to orbit, a feature that no other spacecraft in history has ever possessed. Now, following the success of this mission, but before Demo 2, SpaceX will conduct an in-flight abort test, which will prove Dragon's escape capabilities during ascent. This test will tell us not only how Dragon will perform, but what the astronauts will actually experience if there were an actual emergency. After these tests, the NASA and SpaceX team will review all the data and verify that all of the systems aboard have operated as designed. This extremely important step allows NASA to verify that SpaceX is meeting our requirements and can be certified to carry our astronauts safely to and from the space station. The first two crew members who will fly aboard Crew Dragon will be NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley on board that Demo-2 flight test. Then, NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins and Victor Glover will fly aboard the next Crew Dragon mission with two international partner uh, crew members who have not yet been announced. Yeah, and these NASA ast astronauts will not only be the first to fly on Crew Dragon, but they're also continuing the mission of the International Space Station, which is our premier orbital laboratory. It provides an environment to really learn what it takes for humans to live in space for, long periods, for the long periods that we will need to do when we go beyond low Earth orbit. Let's take a quick look at the history of the space station and its role in furthering human space exploration. The International Space Station, a football field sized million pound laboratory flying around planet Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. It's our home in low Earth orbit and the bridge to exploring the far reaches of our solar system. A place to learn what it takes to live, to work, to thrive in space. Thanks to space agencies representing more than a dozen countries around the world, it went from the drawing board to liftoff when the first piece flew into space in 1998. That kicked off over a decade of construction hauling the station to orbit piece by piece on NASA's space shuttle and Russian rockets. And after the first crew arrived in November 2000, we started an unbroken streak of humans living and working in space. Building on the legacy of past outposts like Skylab and Mir, the International Space Station became the training ground for humanity's next great journeys. Learning how to live in space for extreme periods of time, 
building and perfecting the technologies necessary to travel to our neighbors in the solar system. It gave us a place right on our doorstep to prepare for the next giant leap into the unknown. And thanks to the station, a new era in outer space is unfolding. What was once the domain of only nations and governments is now populated by a growing space fleet from American industry. Private spacecraft to fly cargo and crew members, new habitats and technologies for future space missions, and an open door for companies, research institutions, and even students around the world to do research in space that have never had the opportunity before. All laying the foundation for a robust economy in space. There have been thousands of experiments, hundreds of spacewalks, endless hours of challenges and successes, all done by humans hailing from countries around the globe. The International Space Station is what we can achieve as a planet when we come together to do the things that are hard. And the work isn't slowing down, because we're ready for the next giant leap, because we're ready to go farther, because what we do and learn along the way is for the benefit of all of humankind. We clearly have an amazing responsibility to continue this research on the International Space Station. And that's what drove the creation of the Commercial Crew Program. And right now, we're about T minus 22 minutes and 30 seconds away from seeing our first launch as part of Commercial Crew. So let's check in with Lauren and Dan to hear more about today's mission. Thanks, you guys. So for demo one, Dragon's estimated round trip is roughly six days, and its journey is fairly similar to that of our cargo Dragon when it makes its trip back and forth to the ISS. All right, the crowd's getting into it. As we await that T minus zero in just about 22 minutes, the ground operations teams are going to be doing a series of system checks just to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for liftoff. The moment we hit T minus zero and a successful launch occurs, We'll watch Falcon 9 and Dragon make their ascent until Falcon 9 first and second stages separate and send Dragon on its way to the space station. At this time, mission operators will prepare Dragon for on-orbit ops, and Dragon will execute a series of burns that gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the space station, as you can see in this animation right here on the screen. As Dragon approaches ISS, it'll hold a few times before making one final push towards the space station, putting Dragon into the same orbital plane as it prepares for its approach and docking maneuvers. And then next, Dragon will make its approach and actually dock with the space station. This is going to be a very different process from what we've seen with Dragon cargo deliveries in the past, which use a process called berthing, which requires somebody to be on the station to reach out and grab Dragon with the robotic arm. With docking not necessary, it's going to fly in all on its own. Dragon will spend five days docked to ISS before preparing to return home. Following successful completion of Dragon's test objectives and cargo loading operations, the ISS crew on board will close out the cabin, perform final system checks, and configure the vehicle for undocking. Once the automated undocking sequence is complete, Dragon will execute two departure burns using its onboard Draco engines, pushing it away from the space station. And then next on its trip home is deorbit entry and splashdown, and that's going to cover all operations following the final departure maneuver, including the trunk separation, closure of the nose cone, a deorbit burn, deployment of the drogue and main parachutes, and then finally splashdown, at which point teams from SpaceX will move in and recover Dragon from the water. That covers what to expect on this mission without crew, but it is important to remember that this entire operation is also a training opportunity when we do have astronauts on board. So let's go now to, JAS to NASA's Jennifer Wolfinger at Kennedy Space Center with more on what's going on behind the scenes to prepare for the two. Thanks, Lauren. Ripley may be the only passenger on board this time, but our NASA and SpaceX teams are treating this launch as if Bob Banken and Doug Hurley are flying in Crew Dragon because next time they will be. On launch day with the commercial partners, um, as soon as the crew walks into this room, the suit room, I officially hand them over to the partner. So SpaceX or Boeing officially takes charge of the crew at that point. As NASA's Vehicle Integration Test Office Chief, veteran shuttle astronaut Shane Kimbrough plays a big part in insulating the crew before launch. As teams have been preparing for the uncrewed Demo-1 flight, the crew has been suiting up rehearsing with support teams what they will do for Demo 2. 
One major task has been dusting off the quarantine playbook. We didn't have to quarantine the crew this time, but for Demo 2, there's a lot of work that will go into making sure the crew is protected from any threat to their physical health in the days leading up to launch. It takes meticulous planning to make sure everyone who comes in contact with the astronauts is medically cleared to do so. Launch day operations, uh, while the crew's in quarantine, I control the crew pretty much. So from L minus 14 to launch day, um, they're mine, so to speak. Um, just make sure we run the schedules, we keep them in a quarantine situation, other people aren't coming up to them. Um, on launch day in particular, I'm just making sure they're up, making sure they're moving along according to their timeline so they don't get behind. And making sure they have a chance to connect with their families before they head to the launch pad. One last look um, at your family and one last time to talk to them and tell them you love them and you'll be back seeing those kind of things. Right now, the Demo 2 crew is closely monitoring the pre-launch milestones inside of SpaceX's Launch Control Center, including propellant loading that began just a short time ago. The crew is using this morning to train for what will happen on Demo 2. Everything from strapping into their seats to being prepared to abort in the unlikely event of an emergency. These kinds of rehearsals are not new to the test teams. But this morning's uncrewed launch is more than just a simulation. It's their first chance to practice the real thing. We've touched on all the preparation leading to this moment. Now let's talk about where the crew is heading, the International Space Station. Joining me to discuss this is David Brady. He's a scientist with the International Space Station program. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome, Jennifer. Our viewers have been submitting questions on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Let's check them out, okay? At Flip Flop Life 83 says, I can't imagine life without the science you guys accomplished up there. Do you think this, that this will help prolong space station missions? Oh, absolutely. And it's so exciting to see the folks involved in this are out there. They're so interested in the science because after all, we're all here to celebrate the how, but we need to talk a little bit about the why. And the why is that space station exists as a world-class facility to do research in space. So we're hoping that our CCP capability is going to double the amount of research that we can do in terms of time. Now you might ask, how can you double the amount of research by adding one crew member? Well, as you know, the crew spends a lot of time maintaining the vehicle. They also have to be available for spacewalks. And for every visiting vehicle that comes and goes, they're an integral part of that. But once all that is covered, adding an additional crew member should provide the capacity to do nothing additional other than research. So we're very excited at the capacity to do that because we're looking forward to even more discoveries, enabling more exploration, discovering things that will help commercial companies, and also benefiting people on Earth. It's so exciting. Oh yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> Let's see what our next question is. At JCS Amadora asks, will any cargo be returning from ISS with Crew Dragon back to Earth? And we're expecting to get, be able to fly up about 200 pounds of cargo and also fly back 100 pounds of cargo, which may not seem like a whole lot, but one of the things that it will be useful for in the research area is that, for example, we do a lot of life science research. And that life science research is dependent on biological samples. So you, as you might imagine, if you're a researcher that does biological research, you're looking forward to getting your samples back as often as possible so you have flexibility in doing your research. So the new CCP capability, that's another thing that it will provide for us. That's great. That's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with our viewers. You're welcome. Uh, let's check back in with Stephanie and Shiva for an update. Thanks, guys. Um, we really love hearing the questions from the fans of today's launch. Uh, it's really awesome to hear those. Now, we would be remiss if we didn't tell you about the storied launch pad that Falcon 9 will lift off from today, which is Launch Complex 39A. It's also called Pad A here in Florida, and it's the site of many historic launches. It's where NASA astronauts launched to the moon, and as Daryl Nail is going to tell us, it's where SpaceX has completed a 21st century makeover to the launch pad, launching us into the next generation of human spaceflight. In the 1960s, NASA needed a new, bigger and better launch pad, one capable of sending astronauts on historic journeys to the moon and back. To get there, that new pad needed to be capable of launching the most powerful rocket of its time, the mighty Saturn V. And so, in 1962, NASA began building the answer, 
Launch Complex 39A. At the bottom, a flame trench one and a half football fields long. And above it, a launch tower connecting to a new concept at the time, mobilized launch platforms. With highly explosive rocket fuel nearby, an emergency escape system was added. NASA engineers designed a high-speed elevator and a 200-foot-long escape tube down to a blast-resistant bunker 40 feet underground. In November of 1967, NASA launched the first successful test flight of an unmanned Saturn V rocket from Pad 39A. Historic missions to the moon followed, and another pad, 39B, was added. Decades later, 39A and B were modified to support the space shuttle program. When liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis. From the 1980s all the way to the last launch in July of 2011. After that, the pads went dark. Three years later, Pad 39A got a new lease on life. You see, NASA no longer needed two launch pads, so they upgraded it. And in 2014, SpaceX signed a 20-year lease agreement to launch their own rockets from here, as well as astronauts. And they'll be lifting off from the exact same place that shuttle and Apollo astronauts once did. First, SpaceX needed to upgrade the pad. The massive rotating service structure used to load cargo into the space shuttle was removed. And the most recent addition, a new crew access arm a modernized steel and aluminum structure so NASA astronauts can bridge the distance between the launch tower and the Dragon crew capsule. Just under six years after the last space shuttle launch, fire and smoke returned to 39A when SpaceX launched NASA's 10th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. And a year later, SpaceX showed off the pad's versatility, launching a triple boosted Falcon Heavy rocket on a test flight. And that helped propel the number of launches here over the century mark. And more are planned. NASA and SpaceX have a contract to send astronauts to the International Space Station a half dozen times. And they're going to do it from right here at Pad 39A. And the entire SpaceX team is truly honored that we're going to be launching astronauts again from Pad 39A. At a little over 11 minutes, let's go back to this team at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for an update. Thanks, you guys. So SpaceX has been flying cargo dragons. Everybody's super excited. <laughs> SpaceX has been flying cargo dragons since 2010, but in order to transport crew, we have to make some key upgrades to the vehicle. So in a second here, we'll get an image of the inside of Dragon. All right, so some of the easiest to spot differences between Crew Dragon and Cargo Dragon. First, notice these white composite panels. Those are there to close out the crew's habitable cabin space from the spacecraft's primary structure, as well as the components behind those panels that the crew does not need to access. Another very noticeable interior change is that we've added carbon fiber seats, which are custom sized for each crew member. Crew Dragon can fit up to seven astronauts, but our first crew flight will have two astronauts, followed by operational missions, which will carry four, each of them wearing a SpaceX designed spacesuit. And as you can also see in the video, there's also touch screen, a touch screen control panel. While Dragon is fully autonomous, we have added this for redundancy so that the crew can navigate the spacecraft manually in the event of an emergency. And those NASA astronauts have been working with SpaceX from early on to provide input into Crew Dragon's design. Right now they're finishing their training on all of the features of the spacecraft and the spacesuit using simulators and other exercises in advance of that first crewed mission. And just like the seats, the spacesuit is individually fitted for each astronaut, designed to completely protect them from the vacuum environment of space. While the spacecraft obviously is the primary means of protecting those astronauts, the suit can act as a critical backup in the case of an emergency. And one final interesting point of distinction for Crew Dragon is once again we have windows on the spacecraft, so the crew can look out into space during a flight, providing not only cool views, but also helping them to view the station and orient Dragon during manual piloting. Now let's not forget about Falcon 9. The design of our rocket is just as critical to the Demo-1 mission as is the spacecraft. We have been launching Falcon 9 since 2010 to carry Cargo Dragon, as well as customer satellites inside of our fairing. But the rocket was built from the very beginning with the ultimate goal of carrying people in mind. 
Its simple two-stage configuration minimizes separation events, and with nine first-stage Merlin engines, Falcon 9 can successfully complete its mission even in the event of an engine shutdown. Both F9 and Dragon are designed to be reusable, and SpaceX has reflown six Dragons and 19 first-stage boosters to date. And as mentioned, following today's launch, we will attempt to land the Falcon 9 back on our drone ship in the, in the Atlantic Ocean so that it can be used on a future flight. And SpaceX also intends to reuse this Dragon. Its mission's already set to be the in-flight abort test taking place later this year ahead of Demo 2. Now though, since we're under nine minutes, let's check back in with Tom on the status of today's launch. Thanks guys, we are at eight minutes and 30 seconds until launch. Uh, the excitement here at SpaceX headquarters is palpable. Uh, just a quick update on the status of the rocket and the Dragon. The uh, Stage 1 and Stage 2 are almost fully fueled with both RP-1 and Oxidizer. Uh, the range is good to go. We are monitoring uh, the weather's all looking good to go for launch. No issues with upper level winds or ground level winds or uh, any lightning. The weather's actually looking really good at the Cape. Uh, as John Ensparker always says, uh, the weather is the one thing that everyone talks about, but the one thing that we can't control. Thankfully, it's looking good for launch today. Uh, we're continuing to monitor, but we are going to go over to Kennedy Space Center and uh, see how the Space Station team is doing with Gary Jordan. How's it going over there, Gary? Hey, Tom. Welcome to Mission Control Houston. Right here, the teams behind me are looking after the systems of the International Space Station, which is, of course, the ultimate destination of Dragon launching today. Uh, over the next uh, day, we'll be monitoring Dragon through its approach to the International Space Station, and that's when things will really start to pick up when it's just a few kilometers away. Three crew members on board the International Space Station right now, NASA's Anne McLean, David St. Jock of the Canadian Space Agency, and Oleg Kononenko of Roscosmos. Really, over the past week, they've been reviewing a lot of procedures for the docking operations uh, and the ingress operations. That's when they actually enter the vehicle. Today, uh, they don't really have much going on, a bit of an off-duty day because tomorrow that's when they execute all of these procedures uh, just over a day from now when Dragon docks to the International Space Station scheduled at 6 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, this is a great time, a blast from the past. The last time that a, a vehicle docked to this part of the station was the Space Shuttle back in 2011. Again, our job really picks up when Dragon is just a few kilometers away from now. Uh, this, everything's looking good on the station. Station now 255 statute miles over uh, Central Europe. At the time of launch, the station is scheduled to be over Central Iraq. That's how fast this thing is traveling. Dragon's going to spend some time chasing it down. But this is an exciting time. Uh, we have new vehicles coming online to launch humans to the International Space Station. Of course, more humans means more science, which is the uh, one of the goals of the International Space Station, to do scientific research and learn how to explore further on. We're working with uh, commercial providers as well, not just SpaceX. SpaceX also providing um, uh, cargo to the space station, but we're also working with international partners. But from here in Mission Control Houston, we're going to sit back. We actually have a view of the pad here on the front screen of Mission Control. Tom, we'll take it back to you to take us through the final moments before launch. Thanks, Gary. We are just moments away from our launch of the, crew, of the first crew demonstration mission to the International Space Station. Uh, the Falcon 9 engine chill is underway right now. That gets those turbo pumps cold enough to pump the liquid oxygen and RP-1 fuel to the nine Merlin-1D engines at the bottom of the rocket. Uh, strong back retract will start at about T minus five minutes. That's just 30 seconds from now. And the crew access arm is already in the launch position. Around T minus one minutes, uh, that's when you'll hear the call out Falcon 9 is in startup. That means that the Falcon 9 flight computers have gone into startup mode and they are now autonomously controlling the rest of the countdown. At about T minus two seconds, we will ignite the, the flight computer will ignite the engines and we will check the power on those engines for a liftoff at T minus zero when the hold downs release. Uh, just a reminder that this is an instantaneous launch window tonight. If we have a hold for any reason, we will have to scrub for tonight. But we do have a backup window at March 5th at 1.38 a.m. Eastern Time. The Dragon team has given us the thumbs up for this, that the spacecraft is ready to go. Uh, the range is also green, and we're looking good. Uh, like I said earlier, the weather is looking fantastic at the Cape for both launch and recovery. Uh, with just about four minutes and 30 seconds left before liftoff, let's listen into the final countdown on the launch nuts. And start back retract is starting. RP1 bleed.
Page two cradle arms are open. AFTS final setup started. And back igniter purges. Stage one locks load has closed out. Strong back that retract angle of 88.3 degrees. Pogo bleed verification, stage one. Dragon chill water, close out. Stage two, locks load, closing out. Ground glass close out is starting. Falcon 9 is in startup. Ground gas closed as it's complete. Go for launch. Stage 2 is pressing for flight. T minus 30 seconds. Stage one, pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, lift off. Vehicle is pitching down range. Those of you just joining us, you are watching a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket as it ascends through the atmosphere carrying the SpaceX Dragon 2 capsule to Vehicle orbit. Is 
the vehicle just passed through max Q, which is the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. As you can hear in the background, the excitement at SpaceX headquarters is unbelievable here. The vehicle is passing through max Q. You heard that call out from max Q on the nets. Uh, the Falcon 9 actually throttles down its nine Merlin engines to reduce aerodynamic loads on the vehicle. Uh, it is now throttling those engines back up. Coming up at T plus two minutes and 35 seconds is going to be I'm three events in quick succession. The first one is going to be the main engine cutoff, or MECO. That's when the nine Merlin 1D engines that you can see on your screen right now uh, will cut off. Uh, shortly before a stage separation at 2 minutes and 38 seconds. Shortly after that, the Merlin vacuum engine on the bottom of the second stage of the Falcon 9 will ignite in what we call second engine start, or SES. That will be at 2 minutes and 46 seconds. So stand by for main engine cutoff, stage separation, and second engine start coming up in just about 20 seconds from now. As you can hear from the cheering here at SpaceX headquarters, uh, we did have a successful main engine cutoff, a stage separation. And uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, that second, uh, second stage engine is currently started and accelerating Dragon towards orbit. On the left-hand side of your screen, that is a view from the first stage as it makes its way back down towards the Earth. Uh, let's go down to Lauren and Dan for updates on that first stage recovery. All right, so as you can just see, we lifted off. We had an awesome liftoff of stage one, and stage two is burning beautifully. Stage one also has a secondary mission that it is performing right now, which is getting ready to come back to the drone ship and land. So stage one is going to execute two burns before landing on the drone ship. The first is the entry burn start, which is starting at T plus seven minutes and 48 seconds approximately. Uh, that's where three of the M1D engines will reignite. And what that burn does is it slows down stage one as it re-enters the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. If we didn't do that, that aerodynamic re-entry heating, the aero heating would heat up stage one and it would potentially break it apart. So we got to slow it down. Uh, from there, if stage one is going to coast its way back down using those grid fins to help steer it. And then it'll execute the landing burn. That's going to happen at T plus nine minutes and 24 seconds. That's where we're going to reignite that center E9 engine to hopefully bring stage one down to a beautiful stop right on the drone ship. That's right, and while all that's happening, the second stage, which you can see glowing bright here, continuing to power Dragon, it's going to continue burning until just about nine minutes after launch. So at eight minutes and 59 seconds is where it's targeted to cut off. Down to a single engine, but that one providing a little over 200,000 pounds of thrust to carry Dragon through the upper parts of Earth's atmosphere. Not as much resistance to fight against once you're up this high. And it's going to get Dragon into that initial orbit, and it's still going to be a couple hundred kilometers beneath the station. And then it'll be turned over to thrusters on Dragon once it separates from that second stage to then begin the chase down of the orbiting laboratory. But five minutes, 11 seconds and counting past launch. All the calls so far indicating nominal performance. So we're continuing to see great stuff so far uh, from both, Falcon, uh, both stages of Falcon 9. Okay, we're hearing that MVAC is performing nominally. It's looking good on power. Temperatures are good. And stage one continues to come back nominally. And look over there on the left on your screen, you see that picture of Ripley in that zero G indicator. That's right, keep an eye out as long as we have the view. As soon as Dragon's separated and it's essentially then in its free flight mode, you're gonna see that uh, little planet Earth start to float up. So keep an eye out once we, once we separate Dragon in just a couple of minutes from now. Six minutes past long. Sure, 
trajectory continues to be nominal on stage two. Still have about two and a half more minutes left of this burn, at which point MVAC will shut down. We are just under a minute away from that entry burn on stage one that I mentioned before. Second stage burn continues to burn nominally. Right, we're over seven minutes since that liftoff. Feels like it was 30 seconds ago. <laughs> Continuing to carry Dragon up. It's going to make it to that initial orbit after it separates. The separation coming about a minute after that second stage cutoff. Stage two, propellant tank pressures are looking good. And the burn continues to be healthy. Now coming up in about 10 seconds, that entry burn is going to start. Hopefully we'll have onboard video and you'll be able to watch. Let's listen in on the call outs. Stage one, FTS is safe. Stage one, entry burn has started. Look at that plane. So three M1D engines reigniting. Burn is going to continue on for about another 18 or so seconds. Yeah, so a little back-to-back -back action now as we see stage one coming back down towards Earth, stage two still making its way up into outer space. The dragon still nestled on top, getting ready. Stage one, entry burn, yeah. shutdown. And there's the end of that stage one stage shutdown. Two Okay, so stage one is going to continue to coast its way down using those grid fins for attitude control and steering. Next and then just under a minute. Yeah, that's right. It's coming up in about 10 seconds. In fact, throttling now for Seco. Stage one is trans. And we have had a successful shutdown. Vim back. All right. Stage one landing burn is supposed to start. At the start of that burn, stage one will be traveling at 275 meters per second. That single engine burn is going to bring that from 275 to zero. We did just hear that stage one landing burn has started. See if we get it. away from where it launched from. The vehicle will now undergo its safing procedures. And the recovery team will make sure it's strapped down and it'll make its way back to Earth. Or sorry, back to <laughs> Cape Canaveral. It's already on. <laughs> so there's still a lot more to go here. Uh, we have dragon separation coming up. Let's go back to Tom Perderio to cover that next big milestone. Wow, what a landing uh, coming up very shortly in just about 20 seconds here. Uh, the Dragon spacecraft is going to be separating from the top of the Falcon 9 rocket. Separation should be occurring around 11 minutes and 5 seconds. Just about now. Let's wait for confirmation. Dragon, separation confirmed.
And there it is. You're looking at a view from the top of the second stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. And uh, hard to make out in the uh, shadow of the Earth, but that is the Dragon 2 spacecraft uh, flying in space for the first time after a successful separation. This is a, a great day for everyone here at SpaceX and NASA. Uh, let's go back over to Gary and Johnson and see how they're handling it over there. Uh, it's kind of crazy over here. How is it here, over there, Gary? Thanks, Tom. We were uh, definitely enjoying hearing uh, some of the cheers from over you guys. Well, you can actually kind of see behind us, we got quite a number of viewers here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Very exciting time that we have <laughs> now that they're waving. Uh, so this is uh, for us here in Mission Control Houston. This is just the beginning now that uh, Dragon is in Expected orbit. Uh, we have um, uh, just over a day until Dragon's uh, scheduled to be docked to the International Space Station. There's a li lot of milestones to get through. The crew have been, again, reviewing their procedures, uh, getting ready for some of those moments, again, monitoring the approach and even performing some commands uh, while the Dragon is close enough. But again, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we have docking schedule for 6 a.m. tomorrow. We'll uh, continue to monitor uh, Dragon during that time. In the meantime, we'll toss to Lauren and Dan uh, to witness some of these fi final milestones of Dragon now that it is uh, in orbit. Back to you. Thank you, Gary. Now for a typical CRS mission, right about now, we'll be awaiting solar array deployment. That's right, and as Tom just mentioned, the nose cone is going to be opening, and that's going to expose those guidance and navigation control sensors and the docking mechanism. And then pretty soon, Dragon's going to execute that series of burns to gradually raise its orbit up to align more closely with the International Space Station. So for a quick mission overcap or <laughs> overview recap, we had a successful launch of Stage One and Dragon, of course. We landed Stage One on the drone ship, had video the whole way down. You got to check that out. Dragon has separated, it's activated, and it's now on its mission. So on behalf of SpaceX and NASA, thank you for watching today's broadcast. Thank you for your interest in the mission, and a big thank you to the Eastern Range for helping make today's launch possible. The True Dragon's mission obviously far from over. It's going to spend the next day or so on its way to the space station. It's going to arrive in dock just before 6 a.m. Eastern tomorrow, and it's going to spend five days attached. To get there, it's going to begin that series of phasing burns to raise its orbit just beneath the space station, at which point we begin that slow and steady approach to docking. We will be broadcasting Dragon's arrival and docking live on SpaceX.com and NASA TV. Our coverage will begin at 3.30 a.m. Eastern Time, so be sure to follow SpaceX and NASA on social media for real-time updates. Thank you again for watching, and hopefully you'll join us for docking. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, liftoff. <laughs> 